What a wondrous gift of love. Thank you to the songsters. I haven't heard that song before, but just, yeah, thank you for that choice, Chris. It was gorgeous. So uh, it was good. Just now, um, I just wanted to quickly um, just make an announcement that uh, is actually something that um, I need to do now. I had actually considered doing this as uh, an email during the week and just putting it out there. It's, um, I suppose, some, some information that takes us into the next year and is... Um, quite exciting for what it is. I didn't just want to send it out in an email. Uh, it was actually something that I thought it needs to be face to face. This is something I need to be able to uh, tell you guys um, directly like this. I do need to apologise to, to some of our leaders because I actually haven't had a chance to, to speak to them about this. Uh, but it is something that will be um, impacting for our core as we, as we head into this, uh, this coming year. And um, I think this, this is something that it, um, there may be questions that come with this and uh, people will, will want to just seek some clarity on this. So I just need to read this so that you get the, uh, uh, the announcement directly. And it, and it is this. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, some of you are probably going, serious? That's your announcement? I thought it was going to be something that was groundbreaking, something earth shattering, you know, taking us into the new year. And all you've done is repeat part of the Bible reading from today. Some of you may be thinking that. Others may be thinking, I knew you were going to say that. I'd worked that out. I knew what the Bible reading was. And when you said there was an announcement, I knew what you were going to say. Some of you might have been thinking, yeah, that's, that's pretty exciting. Actually, I haven't seen such and such for a little while. I can't see them around here today. Oh, so-and-so's over there and I haven't bought a present for that person yet. I wonder if the reject shops still have that special on soap on a rope. They've got two for $3. I might be able to... But for some people here, that announcement is something that is... It's, it makes your heart skip a beat. Because this year, your relationship with Jesus has actually changed to the point where you know that this message is life-changing for you. The fact that a Saviour came into the world, that God Himself came onto His creation. The Messiah came, Christ the Lord. That is an earth-changing, life-changing announcement. And for some people, we just sit back and we think, I've heard that story for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, maybe even 80 years. I know what it's all about. And we lose the real impact of what it's about. But today I want to encourage you to know that this is a, uh, a life-changing announcement. This was an announcement that came to the, uh, to the shepherds from the angels. And I suppose it can be argued that, uh, and some people have said this, that uh, this was the greatest announcement that has ever been made in history. In fact, some people say that history is just his story. It's God's story put onto, onto earth. The way that God orchestrated all of this. Now, the danger is that we leave it at just his story, kind of right out there somewhere. If we leave it at, at his story, we lose this real impact of what it can mean for you and me. So we've got to transfer it from being his story to being your story, to being my story. 
that life-changing message that came from those angels to those shepherds. And we want to have a, a brief look at that today. So we're going to work through, the, through this uh, the passage that Christine read for us, mainly the second part of the, uh, of the passage that she read. The first part was Mary and Joseph because of the census heading into, uh, into Bethlehem for that to happen. Again, part of God's story, the way that he orchestrated that to happen. Leaders may think that they have control over the world, but God actually orchestrated that, that Mary and Joseph would be in Bethlehem. So now we have this moment um, of the announcement being made, this great announcement. So if you have your Bible there, uh, we're going to have a look at Luke chapter 2. And first of all, looking at verse 10. Now, I'm sorry I didn't catch the, uh, the page number when that was read. What was that? 1071. So if you have a Bible in front of you, not your own, one of the pew Bibles, page 1071, otherwise Luke chapter 2, and reading verse 10. Verse 10 is this. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring good news that will cause great joy to all people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So that was the message that was given to the shepherds from the angels. Now, the shepherds were very, very lowly people, lowest class of people in, in society around there. You'd probably have them sitting alongside those who would have been in today's society, maybe the homeless or something like that. That's how the shepherds were considered. Nobody wanted to mix with them. So all of a sudden, when this host of angels, and look at them up there, so angelic, aren't they? I'm sure some of the parents are probably thinking, yeah, sure, right, angelic. But here they are, here's our host of angels up there. When this host of angels appeared to the shepherds and gave this news, this life-changing news, this announcement that was earth-shattering, these shepherds are probably scratching their heads going, apart from being terrified at the beginning, they're probably going, serious? You're telling us this information? This is the kind of thing that needs to be told to somebody of influence. You know, maybe those people who are up in the palace, you know, those people who everybody looks up to and when they speak, everybody listens or at least they've got the respect or maybe you should have been telling this kind of message to the religious leaders. They're the ones who can tell about this saviour who is coming. And the shepherds are probably there thinking, you've got the wrong address. This field out here, this isn't where you're supposed to deliver this address to. You've got the wrong people. Do you ever think when God calls you, maybe asks something of you, you think you've got the wrong address. There's somebody else who's better than me, more qualified, better equipped. But God chose those shepherds specifically. And he actually clarifies that to them in the next part of this reading, verse 12. The angel goes on to say, this will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, that's very specific to the shepherds. The shepherds couldn't just go and waltz into the palace and say, we are here to see the baby. They would have um, got to the gate and it would have been shut very quickly. There's no way the shepherd's getting into the palace. Or if it had been at the temple and they rock up to the temple and think, we've come to see the baby. We've come to see the one that the angels announced. They wouldn't have been able to enter the temple. 
Because of the nature of their job, they were considered unclean. There was no way that they'd be able to walk into the temple. But very specifically, God gave these shepherds a message that was directly to them. Where would they find this baby? Lying in the trough the animals eat their food out of. The place where the shepherds would just feel so comfortable, so at home. There was no question about the fact that they could just walk in there and nobody would have asked any questions. In a stable, in a manger, where the shepherds think, I get this, this is just for me. Yeah, sure, kings priests, all of those people had access to this place, but they would have chosen not to go there because that's not my scene. I don't go into those places. But the shepherds are actually welcomed there. No questions. So they might have thought that they weren't the people who were supposed to have received this announcement. But God very specifically said, no, no, this is for you. I want you to be the ones who announce this to the rest of the world. That one angel that started off with the announcement then turned into a multitude, turned into an army of angels. Sam, I was sitting over here. Sam, were you the voice of the one angel? Good job. I couldn't see who it was, but I thought I recognized your voice. And then the rest of them turned up to continue the announcement. And the rest of their announcement is in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now the question here is, what's God's favor and who does it actually rest upon? What is God's favor? The favor of God is that he gives peace to those who give glory to God. Do you see how the angels actually announce that? They said, glory to God in the highest. They began with that. And then it goes on to say, and on earth, to you and me, to us, to the people who are here, peace to those on whom God's favor rests. Now the peace wasn't offered to everybody. The peace wasn't offered to every single person on earth. We may think that peace comes because war ceases. We may think that peace is about uh, putting hostility aside and everybody gets on okay. And that's one element of peace. But peace actually begins when we give glory to God. That's when peace begins. When I recognize that inside of me, there's something that is battling between how I live and how God would want me to live. And peace only comes when I recognize that and I say, God, I need to be at peace with you. I need to bear what is inside of me that isn't as you want it to be. And I need to as we sung earlier, fall on my knees before you. Before the holiness of God, our sinfulness is just made so much bigger. And when we recognize it, all we can do is fall to our knees and say, God, I need your peace in my life. And the peace of God comes, the favor of God comes on those who give glory to God. When we start to give glory to God, when we put him in his right place, 
we begin to have this peace inside of us. And you know what? That peace starts here, but then it spreads out. You can't have peace in here with God and have conflict other places. You cannot have peace with God and still have a beef against somebody else. Peace needs to flow out of us. And we're not going to see peace in this world until people recognise that they need to give glory to God, make peace with themselves and God. Then we will begin to see peace in this world. So it begins with you and me really bearing our souls before God and saying, God, I need your peace in my life that then flows out to my neighbours, to this city, to this country, to this world. So peace on earth begins with you and me. And we see, um, we see that these angels kind of set the example for us with something. The announcement that was given, and I'm going to read it again from here. The announcement was given like this. It says, I bring you good news. So there's something that's spectacular. Good news that will cause great joy. Great joy. Have you ever experienced great joy? Where there's something in you that you just can't contain. You just can't keep it in. You need to speak it out. You need to be able to tell everybody about what's going on. And these angels say, there's good news. There's great joy. And the way that they make this announcement, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to all on whom God's favour rests. They almost set the scene for how we are to respond to this message. They set the scene for us. They want us to be able to, uh, to respond in the same way. And all of a sudden, after the angels have made this announcement, bang, they're gone. And I'm sure the shepherds are kind of standing there going, what just happened? Did you, was that me? Did I see that? Did you see that as well? Do you, were there things up there that we've never seen before, never experienced before? And there's some message. I'm sure this dialogue went on backwards and forwards, trying to make sense of what happened. Because this wasn't an everyday experience. And there was no invitation for the shepherds that said, you've got to go. Get on your... Yeah, sheep, because they didn't have horses or bikes or anything, but they had to go. And I like what happens here, verse 15. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Let's go. There's no hesitation. They didn't kind of stop. They could have made a whole lot of excuses. Well, you know, it's fairly late. I'm not sure it's going to be open in there. Who's going to look after the sheep? If we go and leave these, they're just going to wander. You know how sheep are. They're going to be all over the place. Then we're going to round them all up again. And how do we do that? There's there's no point us going. They didn't make excuses. They just said, let's go and see. What did they say they were going to see? Let's go and see this thing that has happened. I suppose the question is, what was the thing? What was the thing? Was the thing the baby? Everybody loves a baby, don't they? Hey, everyone loves it. You just got to, oh, there's a baby. And everyone, let's go and see the baby, you know. Let's go and see the baby. Was it the baby? 
Or was it the fact that all of a sudden they realised this is life changing. This is world changing. And all of a sudden, we're the ones who know that a saviour, the one who came to bring forgiveness of sins, the Messiah, the promised one, the chosen one, the anointed one, the Lord, the one whom God himself was coming into the world, was it the fact that they were going to go and see a baby or the fact that they knew that the Saviour had been born? And they went, they looked, they saw, they went back. And I love what happens when they go back. And I don't think I'd have these verses on the, uh, on the, the screen here. Verse 20. You'll need to look at your Bible for this. These verses aren't here on the screen. Verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. All of a sudden, the shepherds went from looking after their sheep, from doing this all ordinary stuff, same thing day in, day out, going to see the Saviour who had been announced by the angels, they went and did that, they came back and all of a sudden they're different. They have changed. They've actually got this great joy that is just flowing out of them because we see that they come back. And what are they doing? When I find the right verse, they come back and they were praising God. They were glorifying God for all the things that they had seen and heard. All of a sudden, something changed inside them. They experienced Jesus. They encountered Jesus. They adored Jesus. And I love the fact that they came back and they told everyone. It wasn't something they could keep to themselves. It was overflowing, oozing out of them. They just needed to say something. Do you remember when you first had that encounter with Jesus? that all of a sudden there was something inside of you that you could not contain, that you couldn't just keep a secret, that you had to say something. It changed who you were. It changed how you live. It changed how you spoke. It changed your whole attitude to life. And these shepherds went back to their normal place, but they were different. They were different. They went back with this attitude of praise, glory, adoration, and celebration. Joy to the world. Do you ever sing that song and you just go, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Like that? Shouldn't that be real? exuberance about that shouldn't it be something joy to the world the Lord is come there needs to be celebration about that there needs to be something within us that expresses that joy when we've experienced that I don't know whether you've ever picked up the responsibility in that song for us Because in the last verse, the last verse says, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. That's something about me that says, actually, I need to regain that that joy, that experience of what it is. I need to regain that. I need to relive it time and time and time again. When I recognize the fact that a saviour for me came into the world, For me, I need to be able to celebrate that. But not just for me, 
because repeating the sounding joy means that I speak it out to others as well. I repeat it. I can't just keep it to myself. I need to be able to tell people what this message is all about, what this joy is all about, what this Christmas season is all about. My challenge for you today is for you to repeat the sounding joy that Jesus came into this world, that there is joy about that. As we, um, as I finish just now, I want to take us back to that very first verse. And I want to look at it like this, because this is important for us to realize. Today, which means right now, in the town of David, a saviour, one who forgives sins has been born to you. That is personal. You can put your name in there. He is Christ, the promised Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one. He is the Lord, your master and your leader. For you, And for me, this announcement is one that brings great joy. And we should come with an attitude of adoration, of worship, acknowledging that this is for me and this is life-changing. Don't keep the joy to yourself. Let me say this, I I get it that for some people, Christmas is one of those seasons where people think, oh, I'm just so over it, you know. All the commercial stuff, I've got to buy presents and all of those things. I get that. I get too that sometimes Christmas can be a painful time for people. The memories that it holds, the recognition that... um, family relationships or friend relationships aren't as they should be. And the joy of Christmas can actually be a really painful time. It can really hurt sometimes. But the joy of Christmas is that God sent a saviour for you. He sent a saviour for you you that's the joy of Christmas how do we respond to that oh come let us adore him for he alone is worthy and we'll give him all the glory and when we can do that we experience the peace of of God that he's promised you all the glory you are our saviour God you came into this world to come and take our sin to forgive our sin to cleanse us to make us right with you God you come as the Messiah the promised one the chosen one the only one who can actually be our saviour. And God, today you come as our Lord. And today we choose to accept you as our saviour, as our Messiah, and to make you Lord of our lives. Father, may we just reflect the joy of what that means for us our experience of knowing that you came into this world specifically for me and for each of my friends here. God, I pray that for each one of us, we may know your peace, that we will give you all the glory, glory in the highest heavens. And Father, 
as we do that, may your favor rest on us, your peace, your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. So Lord, as we go from this place today, I pray that we will be people who overflow with the joy of this season, the joy of the Saviour, the joy that you came into this world for me because you love me and you knew I needed a Saviour. So God, as we go from this place, may you bless us and may we just celebrate your joy because who you are. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.